Please open your Bible to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. As you're turning there, I've been asked to remind you that every first Sunday of the month, we have our prayer meeting Sunday night uh, here at the church. We're going to be praying for our unsaved family and friends next Sunday, so please come out and join us. Our text for this morning is Galatians chapter 3, verses 23 through 29. But we will read verses 19 through 29. Would you please follow along as I read? Why the law then? It was added because of transgressions, having been ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator until the seed would come to whom the promise had been made. Now, a mediator is not for one party only, whereas God is only one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? May it never be. For if a law had been given which was able to impart life, then righteousness would indeed have been based on the law. But the scripture has shut up everyone under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith which was later to be revealed. Therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, and there is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus." And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants according to the promise. Would you please join me in a word of prayer? Our Father, as we now come to you through your word, we ask that you would illuminate your truth to us by the power of the Spirit. We ask for understanding and We ask for clarity this morning as it relates to the law of Moses and whether or not it applies to us as Christians. We pray that this morning would instruct us, would free us, would help us, and orient us. We love you, and we ask that your word would have its perfect work in our lives. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As we noted last week that scripture is perspicuous. In other words, that's a fancy word that came from the Reformation that means scripture is clear. But although scripture is clear, not all scripture is equally easy to understand. In fact, Peter said in 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16, that regard the patience of the Lord as salvation, just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you, as also in all his letters, speaking in them of these things, and then he said this, listen, in which some things are hard to understand, which the untaught and undistorted distort, as they do also the rest of the scriptures to their own destruction." Although scripture is clear, not all scripture is equally easy to understand. And we're in a section of the book of Galatians as we're sequentially working our way through that is difficult to understand. And so just like last week, this morning we need your minds. We need to worship God with all of our minds to understand the technical argument that the Apostle Paul is making in this section of Galatians. By way of reminder, the theme of the book of Galatians is salvation by faith alone. Salvation does not come through works of the law, but it comes through faith in Jesus Christ. 
But a group of false teachers had clept, crept into the churches of Galatia, and they began to teach that, yes, Jesus is the Messiah, that, yes, Jesus died for our sins, but if you really want to be saved, you have to obey the law of God. And so Paul is confronting them, perhaps in the harshest of all his letters. In the beginning of chapter 3, he calls them foolish. Foolish for believing that salvation comes through the works of the law. Galatians is all about not what Christ did, but it's about how we receive the benefits of what Christ did. You see, you can believe that Jesus is the son of God. You can believe that Jesus died on the cross. You can believe that Jesus rose again and still go straight to hell. Roman Catholics believe those things, but Roman Catholics believe that salvation, the salvation benefits of Christ come into our lives through works. Paul is attacking that idea that salvation comes by faith and faith alone. But the question arises, if salvation comes by faith and faith alone, what do we do with the Mosaic law? What's the whole point of the Ten Commandments if salvation is through faith? And we hammered that in a very technical way as Paul did last week. And we're going to pick that same theme up beginning in verse 23. Tell my message this morning is out from under the law, out from under the law. I have three points for you. Let me give those to you up front and then we'll work through them. First, we'll note the function of the law, picking up our argument or Paul's argument rather from last week in verses 23 and 24. From there, we will note the freedom in Christ in verses 25 and 27. And third, we'll note the family of Abraham in verses 28 and 29. Let's pick it up then with our first point, the function of the law. Well, if the law does not save, then what is the function of the law? Well, beginning in verse 15, Paul told us that the function of the law is not to replace the Abrahamic covenant. Then in verse 19, he tells us the function of the law. Notice, why the law then? It was added because of transgressions. Now, there are four main interpretation of what that means. It was added because of transgressions. We noted those last week. Some think that it means to restrain sin. Others think that it means to increase sin. Still others, some think it means to deal with sin but I think that the plainest meaning, the most obvious meaning from the grammar is to define sin. And as we noted, for those of you with an NASB Bible, you should have a one next to the word because. You'll notice that one. And if you look in your references, it will say um, that, uh, or for the sake of defining. In other words, the function of the law was to define sin as transgression. It was to define sin as transgression. The word sin is hamartia in the New Testament. And that word has the idea of sinning against God. But originally the word sin was an archery term and it simply meant to miss the mark. When an archer would put an arrow in his bow and aim for the target and miss, it was an error. It was a sin. But unfortunately today, a lot of people think that sin just means I made a mistake. But biblically speaking, sin doesn't mean you made a mistake. It means that you cross the line. It means that you have transgressed against God. The law came to make sure that everyone understands that sin is not a mistake, but sin is rebellion against a holy God. It is to transgress God and therefore everyone who sins is under a curse and deserves the divine judgment of God, as Paul says earlier in Galatians 3. Now, the result of defining sin as transgression is condemnation. So when we're talking about the function of the law, this is review from last week, the first function of the law was to condemn. Notice verse 22. But the scripture has shut up everyone under sin, so that the promise of faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. When scripture defines sin as transgression, 
it means that the law of God condemns the sinner. And we're all sinners. We all fall short of the glory of God. We all deserve the judgment of God and to spend an eternity in hell separated from God because of our sin. The first function of the law was to condemn. But now into our text this morning, the second function of the law that we see in this passage was to imprison, was to imprison. Paul continues his argument in verses 23 and 24. Notice the text, verse 23. But before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law being shut up to the faith, which was later to be revealed. Notice that phrase before faith came in verse 23. Do you see that? Now in the Greek, the noun faith has a definite article in front of it. In other words, it literally reads the faith. In verse 23, Paul is not saying before our subjective or personal faith came. He's talking about objective faith or the faith, meaning the Christian faith. Before the Christian faith came, we were kept in custody under the law being shut up. Now notice the word we in verse 23. Do you see that word we? Now in the context, this word refers to Israel. Paul was a Jewish person and he's including himself in this. We, before faith came, meaning Israel, were kept in custody under the law. Now, although Paul here is saying Israel was kept in custody under the law, the context of this passage seems to indicate that Paul has Gentiles in mind as well. And we'll see that when we get down to chapter 4. Notice chapter 4, verse 3, where he says, So also we, while we were children, were held in bondage under the elemental things of the world. There's some argument as to what verse 3 means, but it seems that he's indicating that the Gentiles were held in bondage as well. We'll get there next week, but for now, let's just understand that in verse 23, Paul is saying that before the Christian faith came, Israel was kept in custody under the law. And then notice the phrase, we're kept in custody. Do you see that phrase, we're kept in custody? That's one verb in Greek, and one lexicon defines this word as to hold in custody to detain or to confine. The terminology is consistent with the Roman use of prisons, principally for holding of prisoners until the disposition of their cases. The law came, the law was given, the function of the law was to keep Israel imprisoned until faith came. Why did God do this? Why did God do this? Well, Paul tells us the purpose of God in imprisoning Israel under the law in the second half of the verse. Notice the verse, verse 23. But before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith, which was later to be revealed. What does Paul mean, being shut up to the faith that was later to be revealed? Well, I think... The New Living Translation gets this verse right in its interpretation. I think it's helpful here. Listen to how the New Living Translation translates Galatians 3.23. Before the way of faith in Christ was available to us, we were placed under guard by the law. We were kept in protective custody, so to speak, until the way of faith was revealed. The law kept Israel under protective custody. God held Israel in protective custody so that they were not able to escape him until faith had come. This is how Paul says it in Romans eleven thirty two: 32. For God has shut up all in disobedience so that he may show mercy to all. Here's a quote from one commentator that makes this point a little bit more clear because this is a difficult verse to understand. Listen to this. Quote, the law was all the while standing guard over its subjects, watching and checking every attempt to escape, but intending to hand them over in due time to the charge of faith. The law posts its ordinances, 
like so many sentinels, round the prisoner's cell. The cordon is complete. He tries again and again to break out. The iron circle will not yield. The deliverance will yet be his. The day of faith approaches. It dawned long ago in Abraham's promise. Even now its light shines into the dungeon, and he hears the word of Jesus. Thy sins are forgiven thee, go in peace. Law, the stern jailer, has after all been a good friend, for it has reserved him for this, and it prevents the sinner from escaping to a futile and elusive freedom. End quote. In other words, the law of God kept Israel in prison as a good friend. Meaning in God's redemptive history, in God's timeline to save people through the promised seed, which was Christ, God decided to raise up a people, namely the nation of Israel, to bring the Messiah of uh, the world into the world. But God loved Israel and in an act of divine mercy and his grace, He sent the law to box them in so that they might find faith in Christ. That's Paul's argument here. Paul is unpacking again. And if you missed last week's message, we'd encourage you to go to the website and listen to last week's message because this is really a continuation from that message. But here we see the function of the law was number one, to condemn, and was number two, to imprison. Thirdly, we see the third function of the law was to tutor, was to tutor. Notice verse 24. Therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we might be justified by faith. Now, this is one place in the Bible where the English language fails us. And what I mean by failing us, that... There's really no English word that captures really well the Greek word here for tutor. Perhaps the closest English word is pedagogue. You're like, what's a pedagogue? You don't have one? (laughs) A pedagogue was a slave of wealthy Romans who was assigned to raise their children from the age six to the late teen years. Moms and dads, I know what you're thinking. How awesome would it be if I could give my kids away at six and pick them up again at 16? That's how the Romans worked. Uh, That's not how we work biblically. But if you were a wealthy, wealthy Roman, that's what you would do. You'd raise your child to about six years old and then you'd hire a pedagogue and that pedagogue would be typically an older man, sometimes a retired soldier. Most of them were slaves. Not all of them were necessarily slaves. And you would entrust your boys, your young boys to essentially be guarded by this pedagogue. And this pedagogue served uh, in a variety of ways. The problem with the word tutor here in our passage is that a pedagogue was not primarily a teacher. Although we do have some ancient literature that says that uh, pedagogues uh, did assist in teaching, so it's not entirely off the mark, and it seems to fit in the context, as we'll note in a minute. But what did a pedagogue do? Well, they were moral guides who restrained sin and taught good behavior. For instance, Plato described a pedagogue as a horse's bridle that restrained children's sin. By the way, moms and dads, foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. Your child is not a saint. He or she is a sinner. He was conceived in iniquity. She was conceived in iniquity. God does not give perfect children to imperfect parents. Your children are totally depraved and your job is to restrain the sin in their life. So if you have a problem with discipline, you're harming your child and allowing their sin to run rampant. Christian parents are biblical in their discipline because we understand the total depravity of man and we embrace the biblical view of parenting that it is the parent's divine calling to restrain sin in their children. Moms, thank you for your work. It's one of the hardest things in the whole world. And by the way, that's why our society's running amok 
is because fathers are not being the heads of their home and parents are not restraining the sin of their children. And that's why you see a decay in our society. This is not me calling for pedagogues again, but it is me saying, moms and dads, remember, it is your job, like a pedagogue, to be a horse's bridle, so to speak, to restrain the sin of your children until they come to Christ and they're filled with the Spirit and they're under the law of Christ. We'll talk about that in a minute. But not only do pedagogues restrain sin in their children, but one... uh, Uh, ancient historian, Greek historian, Plutarch said this, and yet what all tutors or pedagogues do is they teach. They teach uh, to walk in public streets with lowered heads, to touch salt fish with one finger, but fresh fish, bread, and meat with two. I'm not sure what that means. To sit in such a, a posture in such and such a way to wear their cloaks. In other words, that's just a way to say that pedagogues taught young boys how to behave in public. This is called being dignified. By the way, being dignified is one of the requirements of being an elder. Today, there's churches filled with pastors that are undignified. Dignity is a condition to be an elder in God's church. We don't function contrary to cultural norms so as to become a stumbling block from people hearing our message. Recently, I saw a pastor, because he loves to surf, he walks around without shoes on, and when you see someone walking around without shoes on in the mall, (laughs) you usually think, that looks what? Weird. Weird. It's not dignified. It becomes a stumbling block for people to hear the gospel. Now listen, I'm not saying you can't wear shoes, all right? Uh, But you get the point of what I'm saying. A pedagogue's job taught children how to be decent. Moms and dads, you know what I'm talking about. Johnny or Susie picking their nose in public and you slap their hands and you're like, don't do that. That's pedagogue work. All right. (laughs) They protected against corrupting influences. They protected against corrupting influence. Now, although their primary function was not necessarily to teach scholastically, they did assist in teaching. So back to the text. What does this word tutor mean? What function does Paul have in mind? Well, depending on what scholar you read, someone will, there's a lot of different interpretations of this word. I think that Paul probably has all of them in mind. Now, the word tutor seems to me to make sense in this passage. Look at the text again. Look at verse 24. The word tutor, meaning someone who teaches us something, or other translations say schoolmaster, seems to fit the context because Paul defines now the purpose of the pedagogue when he says in verse 24, became a tutor and then to lead us to Christ so that we might be justified by faith. The pedagogue's job is to lead us to Christ. Now, if you're noticing, and I have to say this because Dr. Marsh is in here. He's a Greek professor, if you don't know that. But if you look at the text in verse 24, and do you see if you have an NAS to lead us is in italics? It's italicized. Do you see that? What that means is it's not in the original language. That was inserted by the interpreters to try to make sense. So the interpreters of the NAS think tutor is the best word, and they think it's the best word because of the phrase, so that we are justified by faith. Their thinking is that I, they think that a pedagogue here means that the law of God served in a way that a pedagogue served a child to point that child to what is right or in this case, to lead us to Christ. How do you know that you need a savior? Answer, because you're a what? Sinner. Listen, church, this is so important, and it's not popular today. And if you do this, you're going to be labeled as a bigot. You're going to be labeled as uh, legalistic. You're going to be labeled as unloving. But you and I need to go out into the world, and we need to call sin what? Sin. On Wednesday night, I taught 
our youth group on transgenderism and homosexuality. If you're interested in that topic, you can find it on our website. And the first thing that we need to understand about transgenderism and homosexuality is that it's a what? Sin. Why is that important to say? Because if we don't define it rightly, we're cutting all those people off from the Savior. Because if you're not a sinner, you don't need a Savior. That's why we don't call drug addiction addiction. We call it sin. We don't call alcoholism uh, uh, an addiction. We call it sin. Why? Because if it's just an addiction, well, now you're enslaved to the substance and now you don't have a need for a savior. So in our Christian counseling, we actually sometimes keep people from the savior when we don't call sin, what? Sin. The reason we go out into the world and call sin, sin is because it awakens people to the reality that they are in desperate need of our savior. The law of God reveals that sin is not just a mistake. It's a transgression against a holy God. And when you transgress a holy God, you deserve divine judgment. Woe is me. What shall I do? Run to Christ. He will save you from all your sin. Forgive all your sin and transform you and make you a new creature in Christ. We are people that call sin, sin. It's not popular today, but listen, if we buy into that idea, we become totally ineffective in our evangelism. We call sin, sin. The law is a tutor that leads us to find justification in Christ. But that said, listen, it seems that Paul has something different in mind here. It does, in my mind, seem to make sense that the word tutor is used. But I think in the context of the whole passage, it seems more likely that Paul uses the metaphor of a pedagogue because a pedagogue's function is temporary. What's interesting about Paul's choice of words here is everyone in that culture knew that a pedagogue did not function in the life of a Roman citizen for the entirety of that citizen's life only for about a 10-year period of time. So if Paul would have used a word for teacher, well, the question becomes, well, when do we stop having teachers? I'm 40 years old and I'm still in school. And I'm probably going to be in school till I'm 50. So, at what, so if you have a te- the word teacher doesn't really convey a, a, an accurate sense of time. Does that make sense? But this choice of word pedagogue makes it really clear that a pedagogue is only in a child's life until that child comes to maturity. I think what Paul's thrusting at here is the temporary nature of the law. And if you've tuned out for everything that I've said, this is where you need to tune back in because we're gonna try to answer some questions that Christians often ask. And this leads us to point number two, freedom in Christ. Freedom in Christ. Now, you've probably heard it said before that the book of Galatians is about freedom in Christ. Or as Christians, we have what? Freedom. But what does that mean? Does that mean you have the freedom to live a licentious life and sin? That's not what Paul has in mind. Although we need to make sure that we're using Bible language to understand this. But it does mean that the law of God, meaning the Mosaic law, all 600 and whatever laws, are no longer binding to the Christian. Let me say that again. No Old Testament law is binding to a Christian. Now that statement may have provoked several questions in your mind, and I hope it did, because we're going to unpack some of those questions and maybe clarify that statement. This is extremely important to understand. Now, when we ask what Old Testament laws should Christians obey? If we are blessed in Abraham seed and the Old Testament law ended and it did end by the way, and we've seen it several times in our text. We saw it last week. But notice again in verse 23 that the Jews were kept in custody under the law, being shut up 
to the faith, which was later to be revealed. When did the Old Testament law end? When the faith, the Christian faith, was revealed. Notice again in verse 25, but now that faith has come, we are no longer under a what? Now the word tutor is a metaphor for the law. Now that we are under faith, there is no need for a what? Tutor. We don't need the law at all. But there's a group of Christians out there called theonomists. And they think that Christians are supposed to obey the Old Testament law. Now, there's a lot of reasons that they think this. We do not have time to unpack all of that theology. Let me name some of them for you so you know who they are. James White, very famous apologist. Apologia Radio, Jeff Durbin. Uh, Doug Wilson, a very famous guy that's all around the website that you'll see from Moscow, Idaho. These guys believe that we are to implement Old Testament law in our society. They're post-millennialists. They believe it's our job to make the world a better place. And as we make the world a better place, we issue in the return of Christ. Now, there's a lot of reasons for that. But this idea of theonomy, meaning that the Old Testament law applies for today, is absolutely in conflict with what Paul is saying here. Now that we, notice verse 25, now that faith has come, we are no longer under a what? A tutor. Now, sometimes you'll hear, and I have been guilty of this in the past. I've definitely changed on this. You'll hear sometimes people separate the Mosaic law into three different categories. Maybe you've heard this. The moral law, the ceremonial law, and the judicial law. Because the nation of Israel was governed essentially by priests. You remember, have you heard that before? And what they're essentially saying is, well, we don't have to obey the judicial law because we're not under a, the- or a, a theonomy, or I'm sorry, we're not under a, uh, yeah, we're not under a form of government where God is the ruler. And we don't have to obey the ceremonial rules because all of those have been fulfilled in Jesus, but we still have to obey the moral law of God. And they define that as what? 10 commandments, usually minus the Sabbath. But here, Paul, and nowhere in the Bible, nowhere in the New Testament, Does the Bible make those three distinctions between this over 600 Mosaic laws? Did you know that? Nowhere in the Bible does it it slice them up and categorize the different laws. They're all just lumped into this idea of the Mosaic law. So if the Bible doesn't make those distinctions, we would not do well to make those same theological distinctions. Because the Bible doesn't make those distinctions, we should not make those distinctions. None of the Mosaic commandments, including the Ten Commandments, no longer apply. But wait a minute, Pastor Ryan. We as Christians do obey some Old Testament laws. So how does that work? Well, here's the answer. We are in the New Covenant. Now, I'm going to confuse you right now, but bear with me and ask Dr. Marsh all your questions afterwards. (laughs) When we read the Bible, we need to read the Bible in its context, meaning we need to read it with an understanding of where we are, where we're reading in the unfolding history of God's redemptive plan. So if I'm reading the New Testament, I know that I'm reading in a time where the Mosaic covenant has ended. We as Christians are under the new covenant. Now, this is important. The new covenant is very complicated. It's not simple. The new covenant was given to Israel. We, listen, we hear that in Jeremiah 31, prophesying of the new covenant. Listen to this. Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. And with the house of Judah, not like the covenant, which I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt. So this is not a covenant like the Mosaic covenant, my covenant, which they broke, although I was a husband to them declares the Lord, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel in those days. I will put my law within them and on their heart, I will write it. I will be their God and they shall be my people. They will not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother saying, know the Lord, for they will all know me 
From the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord, I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. Ezekiel prophesies about the new covenant in Ezekiel 36, 26, and 27 when he says, Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your heart of flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you, and I will cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. Christians are not under the Mosaic law. They are under the new covenant. But the new covenant has two aspects. It has a spiritual aspect and a physical aspect. The physical aspects of the new covenant will not be fulfilled until the millennial reign of Christ. But Christians share in the spiritual blessings of the new covenant in the age of the church. Does that make sense? If it doesn't, talk to Dr. Marsh. The point is, is that Today, we live in an era that is dominated when we are blessed in Christ, in Abraham's seed. And so we are not bound by the Mosaic law in the new covenant. Instead, in the new covenant, we are bound. Well, let me back up a little bit. Let me give you some more scripture that makes clear that we're not under the Mosaic law. Listen to this. Romans 7, 6. But now we have been released from the, we have been released from the law, having died to that which we were bound so that we serve in the newness of spirit, not in the oldness of letter. We have been released from the law. Hebrews 8, 13, listen to this. When he said a new covenant, he made the first obsolete. The first is the Mosaic covenant and the Mosaic covenant is what? Obsolete. He made the first obsolete, but Whatever is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to disappear. That's Hebrews 8.13. So why do we keep some of the Ten Commandments? Why do we keep some of the Old Testament laws? Are you ready for this? Are you tracking with me? Now that the faith has come, there's no longer a need for the law. law. There's no longer a need for a tutor. We have been released from the law, Romans 8, or I'm sorry, Romans 7.16, And the old covenant, meaning the Mosaic law, has become obsolete. We are now taking part of the spiritual blessings of Abraham. We're in the new covenant, but there is a law that we obey. Paul calls it two times in the New Testament, the law of Christ. Look at Galatians 6. This is going to fold into Paul's argument. In Galatians 6, verse 2, we read, Bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the what? The law of Christ. Turn your Bible with me to 1 Corinthians 9. 1 Corinthians 9. Now I know, hey, look, this is not bottom shelf cookies this morning, all right? So we're stretching a little bit. 1 Corinthians 9, notice verse 20. To the Jews, I became a Jew so that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, who are those who are under the law? The Jews. As under the law, though myself not being under the law. Now, who did Paul have circumcised so he could minister to those under the law? Timothy. Paul did not have Titus circumcised so Titus could be a witness of Gentile conversion to the church in Jerusalem in Acts 15. But when Paul discipled Timothy, he took Timothy with him to try to convert Jews under the law. But in order for the Jews to even listen to Timothy, he needed to be circumcised. So Paul and Timothy agreed to have Timothy circumcised. Does that make sense? So when Paul says, I became all things to all people that I might save some, he's saying, look, I'm not under the law, but I'm willing to obey all your little commands if we could have a conversation about Christ. Okay? So that's what he's going after. Look what he says, verse 21. To those who are without law, who's that? Gentiles. As without law, though not being without the law of God, but under the law of what? So Paul's saying, I'm not under the law, the Mosaic law, but... So, but what I'll do is I'll go under the law, meaning make Timothy get circumcised so I can minister to them. But when I go to the Gentiles, 
then I'll act like I don't have to obey any of the Old Testament laws. I'll eat shellfish with them. Right on, Paul. (laughs) I'll eat lobster. I'll eat sushi. Paul would say, I'll go to them as without the law. But when I go to them as without the law, it's not as though I'm without the law of God because I'm still under the law of what? Christ. Christ. So that I might win those who are without the law. So the question becomes, what is the law of Christ? Turn to John 13. Now, we're doing a lot of gymnastics, but I hope this is clear to you this morning. Not all things in Scripture are equal, equally easy to understand. John 13, 34. In John 13, 34, we read, A new commandment I give you. Here's a new command. Now remember, Jesus is giving this new command. Has he died yet? Has he resurrected yet? So technically, technically, they're still under the old covenant. But when does John 13 take place? In the upper room the night before Jesus is crucified. And Jesus knows he's going to go be crucified tomorrow. And he institutes what we call communion or the Lord's table is a celebration of the new covenant. And he's teaching them truths about the new covenant. And he waits until the very night before he dies to give them a new, what? Law, Law, a new command. I'm telling you guys now there's something that's new. And what is it? Notice that you, what? Love one another. Even as I have loved you. Do you remember in Galatians 6 2, it said that the law of Christ involves bearing one another's burdens? Turn to 1 John 2. Turn to 1 John 2. I'm running out of time. 1 John 2, beginning in verse 7. This is an interesting play on words. Beloved, I am not writing a new commandment to you, but an old commandment, which you have heard from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard. On the other hand, verse 8, I am writing a new commandment to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away, and the true light is already shining. And the one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in darkness until Now, he's talking about loving each other, but he's saying it's an old commandment, but it's also a new commandment. Why does he say that? Well, the reformer Martin Luther said that the Ten Commandments can be summed up in two things. Well, Jesus said this, not Martin Luther. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as your what? So to love is to fulfill the Ten Commandments. Does that make sense? But we're not living to obey the Ten Commandments, but we are, in a sense, fulfilling them when we obey the law of Christ. Does that make sense? Aren't you glad that you can boil a goat in its mother's milk? Leviticus 19 says, don't boil a goat in its mother's milk. (laughs) Aren't you glad? I'm a fan of the beard, by the way. I like to get my beard long. Some of you are shocked when I cut it short, but it's because I'd rather stay married than have a long beard. Because my wife gets to a point where she says, it's time to cut that thing off. I I love her, so I, I do it. My body is not my own anymore. And sometimes I cut the edges of my beard. Did you know Leviticus says, do not cut the edges of your beard? I'm so glad that command does not apply to me. I know Dr. Marsh is as well. I could see his corners of his beard cut as I looked at him. <laughs> but have you ever stopped and asked, well, how do we pick and choose what Old Testament commands we obey? Because there's some really weird commands in Leviticus. They're, under the Mosaic law, there's just some strange things. How about all you with tattoos? It says in the Mosaic law, do not get tattoos. So how do we pick 
what Old Testament commands that we obey and what Old Testament commands we don't obey? The answer is we don't, we are not obligated to obey what? Any of them. Because we're in Christ, we now follow the law of Christ. And in following the law of Christ, we do, in a sense, fulfill the Ten Commandments. Does that make sense? Paul is going to pick up on this argument and make it more robust when he says, do not walk in the flesh, but rather walk in the spirit. The fruit of the spirit is, Paul's going to talk about that in Galatians. What is the fruit of the spirit? What controls us? What produces obedience to this new commandment? Answer, the spirit. The spirit. This is why we also have church discipline. Because the purpose of church discipline is to identify people that aren't Christians that say that they're Christian. If the spirit of God is in you, you will by the power of spirit fulfill the law of Christ. And as you're fulfilling the law of Christ, you will sin less and less because sin is a lack of love for God and a lack of love for people. Does that make sense? Listen, you're free. How freeing is this? Everybody stop with me for a minute. You ready for this? You don't got to walk out of here obeying the Ten Commandments. Can I get an amen? amen? But you will walk out of here obeying the Ten Commandments. Can I get an amen? amen. You're like, you are so confusing. <laughs> because we follow the law of Christ. Is the law contrary to the nature of God? Do you remember what Paul said last week? May it never be. May it never be. But isn't it freeing? Because oftentimes, see, what we do is when we think about, how am I doing with Jesus? How's my assurance? How's my walk with Christ going? Where do we typically go? To the law. I'm not doing this. I'm not doing that. I'm not doing this. I'm not doing that. I'm not doing this. And we're judging our relationship with Christ by the law. But for those who are in the new covenant, we're not under the law. So what should you do? How are you doing with the law of Christ? How are you doing with the law of Christ? That's a better question. A much better question to ask. But why is the law passed? Well, Paul gives two reasons in the text. Back to the text. Go to Galatians if you're not there. Pick it up with me again. Verse 24, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, again, the faith, there is a definite article there. Now that the faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor or the what? Law. Verse 26, for you are all sons of God through Christ. Do you notice the word for in verse 26 and the word for in verse 27? Those are conjunctions. He's giving us two reasons. So he makes the statement for, or rather, uh, but now that faith has come, you are no longer under a tutor. And then he gives two reasons. Reason number one, you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And we got to do this quickly now because we're running out of time. But this phrase, you are all sons of God is remarkable. You see, the nation of Israel thought that they were sons of God because they were descendants of Abraham according to the flesh. They thought, well, we're Abraham's offspring in the flesh and therefore we're sons of God. Notice, jump down with me to verse 29. If you belong to Christ, you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to the promise. Do you see that word descendants? That's that Greek word sperma. For those of you that were here last week, look back up to verse 16. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his what? And he does not say and to seeds as referring to many, but rather to one and to your seed, that is Christ. The word seed is the word what? Sperma. Same word. The seed of Abraham is Christ. When you place your faith in Christ, you're in Christ. And when you're in Christ, then you're a descendant of Abraham. If you're not in Abraham, you're not a descendant of, uh, if you're not in Christ, you're not a descendant of Abraham. This is what Jesus said to the Jewish people, or the Pharisees rather, in John 8. Do you remember? 
They said, we are of our father Abraham. And then Jesus said, no, you are of your father, the devil. Jesus said to the Pharisees, they're not sons of Abraham because they did not have faith in him. Okay, back to the text. Two reasons. Reason number one, that the law is gone, is for you are all sons of God. This is an incredible statement that you are all sons of God. First, it carries the idea of equality, to be a son of something. In fact, in Galatians, uh, three times prior, two times prior to this, Paul has called Jesus the son of God. In Galatians 2.20, we read, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live by the flesh, I live by faith in the son of God, title for Christ who loved me and gave himself up for me. If you were the son of your father in the first century, it was a phrase that made you equal to your dad. You were the one that that had right to all of your father's inheritance, all of your father's stuff. So this title to say that Jesus is the son of God is not to say that Jesus is less than the father. It's actually a state of equality. How amazing it is that we're called sons of God, meaning that we have a right to all of our father's stuff, if you would. To say it another way, 1 Peter says that we are looking forward to an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled. Secondly, this phrase, son of God, it has a familial connotation. And Paul's gonna unpack that in chapter four And we call this in theology, sonship in Christ. We have been adopted into the family of God and he calls us sons and daughters. Look at verse six of chapter four. And because you are sons, God has sent forth his spirit of his son into our hearts, crying what? Abba, Father. We're gonna unpack that when we get there. There's a lot to be said about Abba. It's often mistranslated. Go back though, you are sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Here's the kicker though, I think. This idea of being a son of God through faith in Jesus Christ, put it back in its context, I think has the idea of maturity. Now remember, uh, a pedagogue was only in the life of a Roman child until that Roman child came into what? Maturity. So notice again the text. Verse 25, but now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor, tutor, that word tutor, it's pedagogue, and we noted the temporary nature of a pedagogue. Why? Why are we no longer under a tutor? We could say in verse 26, because we're sons of God, to say it another way, because we're now mature. We don't need a tutor to point us to Christ because we've already come to faith in Christ. We're mature in Christ. Second reason he gives in verse 27 for why we're not under the law. If the point of the law is to point us to Christ and we're already in Christ, we don't need the law. You hear the logic of the argument? Second, verse 27, for all of you who were baptized into Christ have what? Clothed yourself with Christ. You were baptized into Christ. This is a, this is a dry baptism. To say here that you were baptized into Christ it doesn't refer to the act of baptism. The word baptism just means to immerse. What Paul's saying here is the reason why you don't need the law is because you've been immersed into Christ. You've been immersed into Christ. This is symbolic language to describe our union with Christ. Paul further elaborates and he says, for you were baptized past tense into Christ. You have clothed yourself with Christ. Paul's not saying you literally put Jesus on his clothing. It's a symbolic language to refer to our union. When someone places their faith in Christ, they go into union with Christ. Believers are in union with Christ. Romans 8.1 says, therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. 1 Corinthians 1.30 says, but by doing this, you are in Christ Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5.17, therefore if anyone is in, in Christ, he is a new creation. Ephesians 3, uh, 1, 3 and 4 says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him in love. 
Not only are we in Christ, but the New Testament says Christ is in us. John 14, 20 says, in that day, you will know that I am in my father and you in me and I in you. In John 17, 21, Jesus says that they may be one, even as you father are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you sent them. First John 4, 13 says, by this, we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. When you come to faith in Christ, you are in Christ and Christ is in you. You and Christ are inseparable. You're clothed with Christ. You have been crucified with Christ. You have died with Christ, according to Romans 6, 8. You have been buried with Christ in Romans 6, 8. You are raised with Christ, as we read in our scripture reading this, this morning. In Galatians 2.20, it says that we've made, been made alive with Christ. In Ephesians 2.16, that we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. The idea here is that the reason that we don't need the Mosaic law anymore is because we are now sons and daughters of God through faith in Jesus Christ. We were baptized into Christ. We were immersed into Christ and we have been clothed with Christ. Listen, if the whole point of redemptive history is Christological, meaning that everything points to Jesus, we need Jesus, we need Jesus, we need Jesus. If you have Jesus, you have it all. You're in him. But we're so legalistic that sometimes we act like Christ is not enough, so we run back to the law. We don't need it. The law is no longer binding. Now, put yourself, imagine yourself in the churches of Galatia 2,000 years ago. Imagine being a Jewish person who came out of Judaism and embraced faith in Jesus Christ. Now, the churches of Galatia were filled with Jewish believers and Gentile believers. And you hear Paul make a statement like that. The Jewish people just fell out of their chairs. What? We don't need the law? He just assaulted the false teachers in Galatia, the Judaizers that were saying that they needed the law. By the way, this is what creates that controversy in Acts 15 and all those councils that you see as you're reading through the book of Acts where they're debating the use of the law in the new covenant. Because Paul's contention is there is absolutely no need for the Mosaic law. The Mosaic law has ended. This is a stunning statement. I know I need to land this plane, but I'm gonna give you the third point. And I'll do it quick, I promise. Because this leads to a powerful application that we need to understand. And that takes us to our third point, the family of Abraham. The family of Abraham. Let me tell you something. If the law of Moses is still binding, there can be no unity in the church between Jew and Gentile. If the law of Moses is still binding in the new covenant, there can be no unity between Jew and Gentile. And this is where Paul goes because the church is filled with Jew and Gentile. Notice what he says. Look at verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. Now this is one of those famous passages in Galatians that we all know. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female for you are all one in Christ. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants according to the promise. First thing Paul does is he makes a pronouncement. He says three things in the first half of verse 28 about unity in the church. Number one, because we are all in Christ, because we are all clothed with Christ, because we all, as he says in verse 28, belong to Christ, there is no ethnic distinction. Look what he says. There is neither Jew nor what? Listen. There is no ethnic distinctions here. 
Why? Because we're all in Christ. And we do not define our identity simply by our ethnicity. Now, we do not erase ethnic distinctions. God is not opposed to us celebrating our ethnicities because God is the one who has established our ethnicities. He established it beginning at the Tower of Babel. And according to Acts 17, God is the one that determines the habitation of your life, what country that you live in and come from. We do not erase ethnic distinctions, but we also don't come into the church dividing the church based on ethnicity. Come to a revolve together and taste of all the great foods from around the world when we do a potluck. I love Mexican food. I am not Mexican. I'm married to a Mexican. I love Mexican food. We do not erase ethnic distinctions, but when we come to the church of Jesus Christ, we do not divide over ethnicities because we're all in Christ. And because we're all in Christ, there are no ethnic distinctions. There is neither Jew nor Gentile. But notice not only that, there is no social distinctions. Look at verse 28. There is neither slave nor free man. God is not a respecter of persons. In our church, we have lawyers, we have doctors, we have janitors, we have gardeners. Who cares? Except the Bible says that if you're rich, the elders are to instruct you to be generous. And we're to remember the poor. You see, but in the church, we do not separate based on social distinctions. There are no ethnic distinctions and there are no social distinctions. Why? Because we have all been clothed with what? Christ. Paul says, I don't want to know anything among you except for Jesus Christ and him crucified. Our church is an amazing church. We have so many ethnicities in our tiny church. And we have so many people of all different social uh, economic statuses that all mingle and hang together every week in life groups. And you know why we all do that? It's because we're all in Christ. Now, notice what Paul's doing here. Put this in the context of the passage. What Paul's doing here, there's massive division in the churches of Galatia. And part of the reason there's division in the churches of Galatia is because these Judaizers have come in and they're saying that you have to obey the what? The law. And what that does is it makes second class citizens. So there's some Christians who obey the law, and there's other Christians who aren't obeying the law. And the ones that obey the law, they're the really good Christians, and the ones that aren't obeying the law. And so this division has erupted. And Paul is assaulting that division with the gospel. And then notice what else he said Ladies, there is neither male nor what? Now, again, this does not mean that we erase gender distinctions. We celebrate gender. God has created male and female and has created us in our unique roles. But we as males and females are what? Co-equal. We have different roles, but we're co-equal. Ladies, do you understand that because of Jesus Christ is why you now have equality in the church? It's because Jesus Christ has elevated women to the status that they rightfully are created to have, which is absolute and total equality with men. Praise God for that. That doesn't mean don't celebrate your womanhood. That means embrace your femininity and embrace all that the Bible says a woman is and embrace the God-given roles that the Bible says it is. But you, make no mistake, ladies, you're equal. There are no ethnic distinctions. There are no social distinctions. There are no gender distinctions. Why? Why? Because we're all one in Christ. Listen to me. If you leave the church, if you're an apostate and you abandon the faith, you are not going to find this kind of love anywhere else in the entire world. And what you're going to find in the, else in the world is you're going to see distinctions on social class, ethnicity, and gender. It is only in the church of Jesus Christ that we find ourselves one in Christ. Because we belong to Christ. He closes with an implication in verse 29. And if you belong to Christ, you are Abraham's what? According, heirs according to the promise. Now here's what's interesting. Notice, do you remember last week? I'm sorry, I'm going long, but bear with me. 
see some people bobbing for apples wanting to get out of here. Hang, hang with me, all right? Do you remember last week we talked about the kind of technical argument between the plural form and singular form of the word seed? Do you remember that? Mm-hmm. Notice what Paul does here. He's, he's playing on words. In Galatians 3.16, He makes that argument, he did not mean seeds, plural, but he meant seeds, singular. And now, in verse 29, he refers to those who have faith in Christ as Abraham's sperma, or seeds, plural. So he uses it the same way it's used in Genesis. Genesis uses that word to be singular or plural. You remember that whole argument from last week? If you don't, go listen to the sermon. But the point here is, is it's absolutely amazing. The promise of Abraham was that God would bless the world through Abraham's seed. Not seeds plural, meaning heirs according to the flesh, but seeds singular, meaning Christ. So if you place your faith in Christ, you are Abraham's descendant, meaning that you are participating in God's promised blessing to Abraham in the Abrahamic covenant. This is an amazing thought. We are sons of Abraham. We are sons of Abraham. Because we have placed our faith in Christ. You are not a son of Abraham because you obey the law. You're a son of Abraham when you have faith in Christ who is Abraham's seed. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this technical section that helps us have clarity as it relates to the law of God. Thank you, Lord, for showing us this morning that we are free in Christ of the burden of the law. Lord, what an amazing salvation you have given us. How can it be, Lord, that you, a holy God, would have fellowship with wretches like us? It's because of the work of your Son. And as we place our faith in him, he has done it all. He has accomplished our salvation and in him we are made right with you and in him alone. Thank you, Lord, that we live in the age of the church where we are not bound by the Mosaic commands, but we are free in Christ. But may the law of Christ, the new commandment, meaning that we would love one another. May it permeate every aspect of our lives. We pray that you would make us more loving as a church. We pray that you would make us more loving as individuals. We pray that our love would be defined biblically as sacrifice and not simply by emotive feelings, but we would sacrifice for one another and bear one another's burdens. That we would be like Christ and consider the needs of others is more important than our own. And that we would celebrate our freedom, not as opportunity to sin, but that we would celebrate our freedom as an opportunity to love and serve you and our neighbors. We ask these things in Jesus' name, amen.